Hi and welcome back to the Nook. I am kind of nervous. It's been a while since I did a sit down and talk video like this. Hi, if you don't know who I am, I'm Nat. I mostly talk about books on this channel. Lately, I've been doing a lot of lifestyle content, but um, a lot of you probably know me from some of the videos I did earlier last year on um, labor, on work, on capitalism and having no ambition. So I have become the poster person for having no ambition <laughs> in this world, which is kind of crazy because that's not what um, I think my parents would have wanted me to be known for um, in this crazy online world that I've been putting stuff out on. <laughs> but if you've stuck with me until now, thank you so much. And if you're new here, I hope you enjoy your stay. Um, just keep cozy, get a drink or something because it's going to be a long video. If you don't know how I usually do my videos, it's really chill and really chatty. And I'm not going to be hamming all these information into your face. I want it to be an open discussion. At the end of the day, I just want everyone to sort of go away with their own opinions forming on different things and even if we all don't agree it's something that we can definitely think a lot more about chapter one how do we look up imagine this you've just watched the movie don't look up and you're feeling extremely agitated the movie just kind of made you feel like what do we do now i mean the whole movie didn't even seem to care about this impending doom and it the most frustrating thing about everything was the people. The people were not looking up and there was just no way to get anyone, even if they did look up, to even actually do anything about it. In his memoir, Warmth, uh, Coming of Age at the End of the World, Daniel Sharrow actually talks about this phenomenon called realizing. It is the difference between knowing and realizing, in which you know a fact, but you don't actually realize it until something happens to you. And realizing is a process that happens quite gradually over time. In the same way that people might look up in the sky, they might see the meteor, they might see it coming crashing onto the earth, but they do not realize it until the very last moment when you actually see all the specs and all the disasters happening right in front of your eyes. And what we want to do now is to actually work towards that realization a lot faster than to just know stuff. We are in the age of knowing, everyone knows everything, and even if you don't know anything, you could just search something up on the internet and then you would know it. Knowing is relatively simple, in the same way you could present all the climate facts to someone and that person would now know about climate science, that person might now know that there are certain policies in place or that there are certain targets that we have to reach and we might know that we will never reach these targets on the current trajectory that we're on, but do we actually realize it? Because realization is what leads us to action, but a lot of us are stuck in the knowing phase and not really realizing it. And I know this because a lot of people around me are conscious of the climate crisis, but do not take any concrete steps to change whatever route that they're on, mainly because of all the narratives that seem to paralyze us in place. Narratives such as, oh, you know, it's the fault of the top 100 corporations and we as consumers have no power to do anything, or that it's really just the politicians' problem. It's the responsibility of politicians, the responsibility of the people on top to craft and to kind of move people, move the big money around, right? It's up to like the top leaders to really have this visionary leadership. Uh, but what we tend to forget is that we are these people are all people as well and these people are all embedded into systems that we're all part of and that it is the same system that makes these people um, so unwilling to make changes that might actually matter and it all actually also affects us in our everyday micro decisions as well. So why is it so hard for us to actually realize all these things? Why is it so hard for us to actually take action when we know things? And I mean, that's so frustrating. Like you know things, but you just cannot take any action. And now let's move on to chapter two. First, we deconstruct. Now, I don't want to be propagating the same uh, neoliberal ideals in which every single individual is held wholly responsible for the world's evils. No, I don't think that reducing your carbon footprint is the only solution um, to actually <laughs> trying to mitigate the climate crisis. And I don't think that shopping sustainably as a lone consumer will save the world. I don't believe that. I don't think that you know, everything is about the individual. But I do believe that it all starts with 
a personal reckoning of the things around you and it starts from there for everyone. That would sort of gradually lead into a more collective consciousness that will hopefully fuel the movement into something a lot more positive and a lot more concrete in the future. And so what I mean by deconstructing is to unlearn things actively, consciously, and not just to know and recognize things, but to start to really break down these ideas in your head and then subsequently replace those ideas with something that's a lot more sustainable, a lot more positive, a lot more world building. A lot of people, when you talk about the climate crisis, we tend to only talk about, um, say, very specific things like uh, carbon emissions, or we might talk about uh, deforestation and things like that. But what we understand about the climate crisis is that it's a multi-pronged uh, problem. It's not just a problem of the environment, it's a problem of incessant inequalities in our society, the way that we treat nature, the way that we treat each other. These are all the reasons why the climate crisis has been building up to such a huge, huge like degree, severity. It's not just because we were emitting carbon, but rather it's because of the system that enabled this kind of very greedy consumption of things uh, at the demise of people, at the maximizing of profit and a maximizing of kind of this very materialistic pleasure that has led to a degradation of this of of society and a degradation of like nature to such a severe degree and it's not just carbon emissions in itself but an entire system that propagates this kind of destruction so what we need to do first is to unlearn all these things that have enabled this system to continue and no i'm not just saying you yourself just one person alone is responsible for this. I'm saying that you and the people around you and the people at your workplace, the people in your leadership positions, it is everyone's obligation and everyone's responsibility to always question our own beliefs that have been internalized from young, especially beliefs about growth, beliefs about productivity, beliefs about value, beliefs about nature, the environment, beliefs about other people, right? Um, these are all things that affect everyone. Um, if we are able to actively find ways to deconstruct our beliefs in a healthy way and bring that to our communities and bring that to our leaders, I think that's something that really addresses the root of the problem rather than uh, pushing for very, very superficial things that people might see as potentially helpful but it doesn't really solve the bigger issue at hand. So one of the main ideas that we also have to unlearn and which is something that I touched on in earlier videos is the idea of capitalism as naturalized and this is something that I've seen a lot of people talk about not just in terms of the climate crisis but just as one of the key examples of how such a major ideology have been in, has been ingrained in our minds which is that profit has to be sought at any cost and that profit is what determines the success of a business or a success of a person, the success of whatever human innovation, ingenuity is there, you know. And this notion has been so internalized that people would go to any cost to achieve that purpose and to achieve that. And the fact is that at what you know, at what level is it actually true? If you want to go into the details and you talk about GDP, which is the gross domestic product of a society, most people assume that increasing GDP will increase in, you know, the general wealth, the prosperity of a country or a society, etc. But we all know that as, you know, in this book that I will put in here and in a lot of talks that you see and a lot of people have been discussing about GDP, GDP is actually not an accurate indicator of how well a country is doing. And the GDP itself is fluctuating so much and it's so arbitrary. And although it can be a useful metric for economic planning in certain circumstances, it has now attain a godlike status in so many conferences where GDP cannot just be touched, like it cannot even be questioned. And it is this kind of unquestioning stance that we have to so many big ideas in society that I want people to actually start to break down in your own life, actively unlearning these internalized notions will then translate to being able to articulate some of the issues around these problems outside of your own life. Say, for example, you can start to bring it up in conversations with friends or bring it up in conversations at your workplace and to slowly get people to question some of the unquestioned dogmas that we have kind of running the show in everywhere that we go. So basically, in this chapter, what I suggest as a form of deconstruction 
is to actively unlearn, decolonize, and diversify your way of thinking. So here are some books that I would recommend for that in case you want to because this is a booktube channel so I have books every book that I have read that helped me in this journey I've linked down below moving on to chapter 3 reconstruction now if you don't know like my bio and my bookstagram it's deconstruct then reconstructing and I really live by this mantra because I have noticed online that commentary videos are extremely popular you know, um, all sorts of videos kind of providing really nuanced critique on so many issues, on so many things in the world. Those are great and I love watching a lot of, the, of a lot of these commentary videos as well. But what I realize and what I'm really afraid of is that we are commenting so much but we are not creating anything new. We are not replacing old frameworks with anything new that will actually help us move forward um, and that we're just stuck in this stalemate and I struggled a lot of this in the past year because I was learning such great theory but I just couldn't actually um, practice it. I just didn't know how to really enact any of these ideas in my own real life and that's why I spent such a long time the past few months not wanting to do any commentary videos because I just didn't want to be critiquing when I couldn't live the life that I wanted to envision. So I'm not there yet. I'm not at a perfect place yet. But this is what I want to offer to you all, which is that let's move on from the debate. Although we can of course engage in a healthy amount of debate once in a while, but I want to move on from debate and I want to move on to discussing viable ways forward. I want to open up the conversation for all the new ways that we can live our lives, all the new, all, all the imaginaries that we can unleash in terms of how we can actually arrange society or how we can actually relate to each other, how we can relate to non-human beings, how we can relate to the idea of money, how we can relate to the idea of value. And I want to see more of these discussions happening rather than, you know, once again talking about how terrible a certain person is, although we all should know how terrible a person is, but let's have a greater discussion on things also outside of that. These are some of the ideas that I've encountered in the past few months. And the first idea is the world ecology theory. And this goes right to the whole depth of it. And this is about the nature-culture divide. The nature-culture divide is something that a lot of theorists push forward as the main reason why a lot of us cannot seem to move past this capitalistic view of the world. And that's because we tend to isolate ourselves from the world. We isolate humans as this one special species that seems to be naturally dominant in this world and that everything else is considered outside of humanness, of humankind. Uh, but we all know that humans are inherently part of a wider ecosystem. As much as we are considered apex predators, we are all kind of artificially made that way through our own innovations. But in reality, we are living alongside a whole bunch of non-human entities and that we are living in an environment that's out of our control and that we should actually be a lot more aware of that. Being ecological is something that is inherent to us and this is something that Timothy Morton writes a lot about and the fact that all art is ecological, all ways of seeing is ecological and we as humans are ecological beings whether we like it or not as much as we believe that we are you know non natural, as long as we artificially reconstruct ourselves as much as possible, we are still biological entities, we still live in this world, we are still neighbours with the world, um, and as much as we want to move and move to other planets or whatever, you are still going to be part of the ecosystem in all those planets, and there's no way to kind of really cleave nature and human to such an extent. And what is really culture? Culture is something that also belongs to groups of animals, groups of non-human entities as well. Culture itself is also something that we should acknowledge as not just belonging to humans and that there's a whole world out there that we as humans just cannot understand. And once we have this kind of thinking moving forward, we might actually treat the environment a lot nicer. We might actually have respect for all these beings that have a lot of wisdom to pass to us and that we don't see ourselves as just like the 
top dog uh, in every situation that we're in. The way that we define humankind has always been by conquest and domination, but that in itself is not true because if you trace the lines of imperialism and colonialism, you start to realize that a lot of these things were made a lot more unequal with that beginning of a conquest. And the way that we see value according to racial identity, according to gender, these are all fluctuating all the time across human history. So once we see that all these things are actually as malleable as they are in history, we might not actually find them to be such restrictive categories to be stuck in all the time and that to actually re start to reject some of these very inherent dogmas that we tend to internalize from a very young age and you start to really be more, much more free in forming opinions that are really your own and start to really see what are the systems that might work better for where you are right now. Another writer that I think is great for this is Donna Haraway's Save the Trouble. I think she really posits a great way of relating to non-human uh, forces and non-human presence and all that. It's really such an amazing read to uh, hold on to it, to really bask in. Next is the book that has actually inspired this entire video, Post-Growth Living by Kate Sopa. So this is a book that I really want to encourage more people to read in a way that it does outline a great way of moving forward in an affluent society. So if whatever I said about like world ecology and, and being friends with like non-human entities, maybe that sounds a bit too like fluffy for you and you are someone that lives in a relatively affluent society where you are kind of like in a world of excess consumption, you're in a world that's highly developed and that technology is sort of seen as the end all solution to everything and that consumption never seems to stop, then I have this quote for you. The call to consume less is often presented as undesirable and authoritarian, yet the market itself has become an authoritarian force, commanding people to sacrifice or marginalize everything that is not commercially viable, condemning them to long hours of often very boring work to provide stuff that often isn't really needed, monopolizing conceptions of the good life by preparing children for a life of consumption. We need, in short, to challenge the presumption that the work dominated, stressed out, time scarce, and materially encumbered affluence of today is advancing human well being rather than being detrimental to it. And that's quite apart from the effects our consumption is having on the natural world. Rather than hankering after technical quick fix solutions that might keep labor and consumer spending indefinitely on costs, the developed nations would be better off focusing on the formation of a much needed alternative model of progress and breaking with current ways of thinking of uh, prosperity and well-being. What I reckon is the way forward for a lot of you living in affluent societies is to really, we should all really start talking about ways to actually live a much happier life and I I think it's crazy that we're settling back to what makes you happy and not happy in like a very very superficial fleeting way but what really gives you pleasure and this is what Sopa talks about alternative hedonism in which where we think about what gives you pleasure and we think about what is the root of a good life which is human connection alignment of one's values the time the free time to really develop your your thoughts and your se sense of self, these self-actualization goals that do not have to happen in a capitalistic world where everything about that is commodified, where everything about self-actualization comes with a price tag. Rather, we should seek other ways of living that do not happen within a capitalistic form. Um, and I just feel like consumption is something that we don't talk a lot about. And I know that in the online discourse, there are a lot of people that might say that a certain level of consumption is necessary to exist in the affluent society. And I am not fully convinced of that fact and I will link down a video essay that I watched below about the idea of fast fashion and why is it that people are saying that you know if you're poor you should be able to buy fast fashion but the idea is why are we allowing fashion ideals to be so entrenched to the point where you know we are enabling people to buy from fast fashion instead of critiquing each other about the way that we consume fashion what if we start to really think about fashion differently? What if we start to think of fashion as something that's not just slow fashion, but refashioning, where we can take different elements, put them together, and that we don't need to produce new clothes to have fashionable items. And that to be fashionable doesn't mean to be trendy, but rather it means to have a good eye for what looks good on you.
because that doesn't need things to be trendy. You don't have to look like every other person on the street. You don't have to emulate your favorite celebrities. Instead, you can actually focus on making yourself look good and feel good according to what you like, the textures that you like, the colors that you like, and that is what I would call fashion. So. In that same way, we can also take whatever things that we have learned about consumption, consumerism, and start to really think about the ways that we can move forward from there. And that things like, oh, um, having this object signals a certain status, and that we can think of it differently that, oh, I have this amount of time to really go into a hobby that I really like. So these are just small things that I feel like we can all actually start to discuss a lot more and start to really enact in our everyday lives. And now let's move on to the next chapter because I'm, I'm kind of going into it already. <laughs> the next chapter, claim being back your every day. The personal is political. Now, if you have studied feminism before, and this is a this is a saying that's pretty commonly attributed to second wave feminism, and it's something that I really hold very close to my heart, in which the personal is always political, and that we should really start to claim back the everyday as a space that we can actually politicize. And not in a way that I mean politics with a big P, but rather politics with a small P, in which we are made conscious of the ways that we reenact um, societal structures or the social order, the way that we reenact these differentials in power, and also all the spaces, all the pockets of space that we can start to enact something different, something new, something visionary and radical in small ways. And like I mentioned, it could be as small as taking back a, a pocket of free time and doing something that isn't commodified, isn't commercially viable to others, doing that for yourself and for your loved ones, claiming that that space, that is a radical act of resistance in an everyday, right, in a world where your everyday is being squeezed out every second, every minute, being bombarded by advertisements, what you can do is to claim back that just one hour for yourself. But the thing about radical envisioning is that it's true, it's often only afforded to those that are the most privileged, and I talked about this in a, previ in a previous vlog where, you know, I feel that because of my time off, I was able to really dive deep into all these ideas. I was really able to give myself the time and space to really think about these things and how I relate to them. And this is something that I know a lot of you don't have. And this is something that's really unfortunate where, you know, the people that need this kind of radical envisioning the most are the people that are made the most time pressed, the people who are made the most vulnerable in today's economy. And I think this is something that is terrible. And I feel that this is something that we can all try to really start pushing back on. Stop expecting such insane levels of productivity from people working certain jobs, maybe say an F&B service crew, that we can all actually give out give each other a bit more slack in a way that we expect things to be run, right? And that we can actually give each other more time off. And if you're in a position of power where you can actually give someone more breathing space and do that, everyone needs to collectively agree that we actually don't need to rush for things and that we can afford to take more time back for ourselves. And so I feel that everyday resistance is something that we can practice. Um, and it's really this mindset shift that you don't have to see politics as this big scale thing where of course that is important writing to your uh, representatives writing to your people in power that's important as well but it's also as equally important to be able to live out your politics in an everyday way and to influence the people around you as far as possible in whatever sphere that you're in um, and we need as many people to actually jump into this form of activism as much as possible how to do nothing by jenny otto that's a great book talking about everyday resistance in the form of rest and relaxation in today's overly productive uh, work obsessed world and i'll also link down a couple of books below that i've really that have really helped me understand how it is really about the everyday that's political and the refusal of work by david freight is also a great book to read about the way that everyday people have been taking back their lives in a way that they have rejected ideas about work and this actually has led them a lot has led a lot of people to realizing bigger issues around the way that they treat the environment and the way that they treat human relationships and it starts from actually rejecting something that's so central something as central as work in their lives moving on to the very last chapter thank you for staying with me till this very last chapter and this is the chapter that i'm the most excited about and that is create create Create! <laughs> Why am I just shouting it into the oblivion? The last chapter, and something that I really have come to a huge realization is that I want to make living simply 
living fully. I want to make that cool. I want it. I want to make this idea of an ecologically sustainable way of life that isn't obsessed with productivity. Uh, a life that where we can really slow down. I want that to be desirable. I don't want materialistic things to be desirable anymore. I want something as simple as making friends with the animal outside your house. That is cool. Taking clothes from your grandma's closet, of course with her permission. Wearing it in your own way, that is cool. Taking the bus, going everywhere on a bike, that is cool. And I want all these things to be desirable. And I want these things to be the aesthetics that we move towards. Kate Soper actually talks about this in the last chapter, in one of the last few chapters of her book, in which an alternative hedonistic politics of prosperity will depend in part on the evolution of an altered aesthetic response to the material culture of consumerism. It will evolve wider resistance to the appeals and promises of advertising and a general shift of optic on the supposed attractions and compulsions of consumer culture. And so this is where you all come in as well. And I know that you all on the internet are extremely capable of aesthetics. What is aesthetics? I don't even know. I mean, there's an entire field of study that's dedicated to the study of aesthetics and the study of how aesthetics have influenced our lives. And we know about the kind of increasing popularity of aesthetics such as cottage core, right? Uh, solar punk, and all these great ways of actually envisioning uh, lives that are a lot more sustainable, a lot more pared down, a lot more kind of community involved, collective action driven. These are the aesthetics that we should move towards and we should start to appeal them on a larger skill and that we should use the creativity that has been traditionally funneled towards advertisements, to advertising, to uh, marketing, to commercial stuff, whatever. We should bring all that creativity to building this better envisioning, better vision of aesthetics that will help us really take concrete steps forward. I also learned very early on, like a year or two back when I read Adrian Marie's Brown book on pleasure activism and that the act of activism itself, when you want to seek liberation and joy and emancipation, all these things should come from a place of joy, it should come from a place of desiring something better, of desiring something that is so much more worth it, something that makes so much more sense to the livelihood of people, to the actualization of people and the diversity of experiences that we have, that you know the way moving forward should be based on that rather than based on sacrifice, based on um, deprivation, de- based on a reduction. And that's what I think a lot of discourse about the climate crisis is today, is that oftentimes in affluent societies, we see everything is cutting back on, right? That we see that taking public transport is a step down from owning your own car. That sort of eating vegan is considered to be a loss of the kind of gastronomical experiences that come with eating meat. But rather we should reframe these things and see them as places of potential liberation and joy. And that eating vegan could be seen as a way of really honoring the earth, honoring the animals and the lives that they live on this planet taking to the public transport can be seen as a way of indulging in the sensations of the world. And this is something that Kate Super talks about as well in Alternative Hedonism, in which the cyclist and the person, the pedestrian, experiences the sensations of the world that person in an insulated car cannot. And this is the kind of pleasure that we should move towards, a pleasure of wholeness, a pleasure of living, and not just this kind of very senseless, passive Um, internalization of everything that goes on in our world and it's about recovering your sense of agency and recovering a sense of imagination for what a better world can look like and I know that this message will probably speak to a lot of you more in affluent societies and I want to acknowledge that this message will probably only really make sense for a lot of people that have the time and space to really digest it and to enact it in their everyday lives but what I hope is that this is not something that can only be triggered by the privileged class and if you're in the privileged class i want you to also take on this privilege of yours and use it to start conversations on what it means to have a better life and to actually start to use your power and influence in your own spheres as well because a lot of you actually have a lot, have a lot more power than you think that you have i'm going to end this entire video right um with just this one uh line one quote from tony kate barbara who is a great activist Um, in the kind of black and feminist liberation movement uh, and that is the role of the artist is to make the revolution 
irresistible. And here is my invitation to you to make this new way of living irresistible to yourself, first and foremost, to live that life and to make it irresistible to everyone else, and to encourage people to come into this new fun dance party. The music is great, the food is even better, it's healthy for you, it's healthy for the planet. Get out of that seat, that dreary seat where you are always constantly unhappy with the way things are and to seek your own way of doing things and to bring your community along with you. So I feel like that's what I want to end this whole entire video on. And I have no idea how this video will turn out because I've just been talking off the top of my head as I've done in many of my earlier videos. And I hope it was useful for some of you. Uh, these are all really preliminary ideas. And, I, and again, I want to emphasize that these things are ideas and I don't have any concrete plans for all of you because everyone's circumstances are different and I think all of you know best in your own specific situation and your own local area what you can do. And I'm still figuring that out for myself as well but I do hope that whatever ideas I've shared in this video and all the resources I shared in the links down below will help you in figuring out your own framework moving forward and that's what we really need moving forward. We need to open up more conversations about what is a good life, what is meaningful work, what is a good way to live in this world as neighbors to non-human kinds, what we can do as people to really reduce the inequalities that we see in our everyday. Those are my ending thoughts. I want people to talk about the climate and talk about social change and to see all of this discussion as a wholesome, generative experience for everyone and that liberation is a fun thing and that people can focus on creating their own narratives of joy and agency in their own world and I kind of want to see more of that and I have seen glimpses of that here and there but oftentimes on my in my day-to-day -day when I go online and I read books it tends to be really really critical um, and I struggle with finding new ways of moving forward and like the light that I need to follow um, and I hope that this video was a little bit of that light for you all and so thank you so much for watching this video I hope it is something that is a good continuation of my past video essays I had a lot of things to say maybe a lot of things may not have been said very clearly as how I have imagined it to be but I I have said my piece and I am really happy, very grateful to always have this platform to say my own opinions and to say my piece and I really want to encourage more of you to take whatever I have and to form your own thoughts around it. I am not here to tell you exactly how to think in your own way. What I want to be is as a person of encouragement. Again, thank you so much for spending your time with me and I appreciate you so much and if you have the time today. I do hope you get to rest, relax and rejuvenate. I do hope that you take back the day tomorrow and the all and whatever after. This might be my last video for the month and for a while. And if it is, uh, don't miss me too much. I will be back sometimes to update this channel. And I just really wanted to leave everything on a really nice note. Uh, this is not the end of this channel. It's just maybe a mini break, a small break for myself. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Go out and claim the day. Yes. Stay tuned for other videos that might be a lot more bookish and boring than this one. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around. And yeah, what else am I saying? I don't know. But um, rest well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.